Welcome to The Neuron, I'm Pete Huang. Today, in April, an OpenAI researcher was fired for allegedly leaking important information. Now he's going public with his take on the future of AI. Are we in for world disaster? It's Thursday, June 6th, let's dive in. If you work in the tech industry in San Francisco, you're surrounded by some of the most talented people in the world. And I mean that very literally. You could walk into a party and all of a sudden there's this one person who researched this crazy new material. There's another person who started this amazingly large company. These people are everywhere here and you get kind of used to it until every once in a while you read the background of someone and you're reminded of how insane it all is. Leopold Aschenbrenner is one of the most recent versions of those types of people to me. Until recently, he was just a name on paper for me. I mean, back in April, the information had reported that he and another researcher at OpenAI were fired for leaking, and that was pretty much the extent of my exposure to him. And then I got to reading about his background and his work, and boy, this is one of those people that you're just blown away by. So here we go. Leopold Aschenbrenner from Germany, really curious student, extremely sharp, would be one of those kids that would push for more and keep digging at topics at school. Did quiz bowl and debate and science competitions. For one of his science projects, he and a teammate built a system that would track and warn and notify you about fine dust levels in Berlin. And that won the top spot in all of Berlin that year. Leopold then goes to college in the US at age 15. He's at Columbia University studying statistics, economics, mathematics. And of course, he thinks it's completely normal to be there at 15. He fits right in. At age 17, between his sophomore and junior years, he publishes a paper, a 100-page thesis titled Existential Risk and Growth. And in this paper, he's arguing that some of the technology available to humans today could actually threaten human survival and that ultimately faster economic growth will reduce that risk because we can spend more on safety measures. And remember, this guy is 17 years old and he's spending his days thinking about the relationship between economic growth and human survival. I don't think there are many 17 year olds in the world that are doing that. Now this paper gets picked up by a prominent economist named Tyler Cohen, who literally says, look, this paper of yours would have been impressive if it was coming out of an MIT PhD program Dude, you are 17. You are a legend of an economics researcher. Fast forward another two years, Leopold is now 19. He's graduating from Columbia University, top of his class. He's named valedictorian, and he wins best senior thesis in economics, obviously. I mean, this dude is stacked, right? Leopold spends a few years after graduation continuing with research in economics and thinking about these big questions about the future of humanity and technology, of course, he's moved to California, to the Bay Area. And in 2023, he joins OpenAI on the Super Alignment team. It's the team that OpenAI started in July of that year with a promise to dedicate 20% of their computing resources and a four-year goal to solve this question of making sure AI helps humanity rather than hurting it. Very in line with the type of questions that Leopold was thinking about in college. And this team, by the way, the super alignment team, is the team that recently got disbanded after its two leads, Ilya Sutskever and Jan Laika, both decided to leave OpenAI. Let's talk about why we're talking about Leopold Aschenbrenner today. This week, Leopold released a series of essays that has generated a ton of buzz in the AI and broader tech community. It has to do with the bigger question about AI. Just how powerful is AI going to get? And what are we going to do about it? Leopold's general argument is this, that we are on our way to super intelligent AI. We are not on track to do this safely. We need the government involved and China is going to be out to get us on this. Oh, and by the way, Leopold is also starting a hedge fund to make investments based on the stuff he sees relating to AI. That's sort of a separate thing. Now, if you look at his actual writing, it's a pretty dense set of essays. So today I want to walk you through what he's saying and the sort of back and forth that has happened since then. First, let's talk about AI. 
AI has always been a moving target of a definition. I mean, at some point, even the autopilot systems on planes, that was called AI. Even the programs that play chess against you on a computer, those were called AI. And all of this AI up until the last few years is very narrow. Like the AI program that helps you fly a plane cannot also play chess. They're all super specialized to what they were trained to do. Recently, we're getting to AI that is more general in nature, right? ChatGPT can think about marketing strategy, but it can also tell you about repairing things in your home. What we're improving on now is the reasoning capability. We're currently on GPT-4, but a few years ago, the best thing available was GPT-2. And GPT-2 can't really compare to GPT-4. It's just not nearly as capable at thinking about things and coming up with a well-reasoned answer. That's changing pretty fast. By whatever description you can think of, GPT-4 is probably somewhere in the range of a high schooler when it comes to reasoning capability, even if it's regularly beating human averages at complicated tasks like medical school exams and things like that. As we continue, the big debate is about two general levels of AI capability. One is called artificial general intelligence, or AGI. The second is called artificial superintelligence, or ASI. AGI is an AI that matches humans. Anything a human can do, AGI can also do. ASI is an AI that exceeds humans. It can do things that humans can't. Now, this is like Skynet from the Terminator series. This is an uber powerful system that can take over anything if it really wanted to. So let's talk about AGI, ASI, and what Leopold Aschenbrenner is seeing in his perspective. Getting from GPT-2 to GPT-4, from a preschooler to a high schooler, was simply a matter of training more. The models didn't really change all that much. You just jammed more training and more data in there. The question is this, what happens if the trends continue like they have been? If we take the same amount of improvement that went from GPT-2 to GPT-4, again, from that preschooler level to the high schooler level, and then just start at GPT-4, where do we end up? I mean, this is kind of a dumb comparison, but preschool to high school is like 13, 14 years of education for a human. If you give a high schooler another 13, 14 years of education, they would have a PhD. And because this is all happening in a computer, when you have one AI model that is as good as a human with a PhD, you actually have millions, hundreds of millions, billions of them. So if you suddenly had a million PhD level AI models that could just do more AI research, doesn't that pretty much guarantee that you will have ASI very shortly afterwards? Okay, let's take a breather for a second. We were just talking about GPT-2 and how it was no smarter than a preschooler just a few moments ago. And now we're talking about Skynet. Like, geez, that's a bit of a jump, isn't it? The specific arguments behind it kind of go like this. If you want to say, let's take the same improvement from GPT-2 to GPT-4 and see what happens if we continue, then you first have to know how much actual improvement there was in GPT-2 to GPT-4, right? Leopold does this by measuring how much computing went into training these models. Again, remember that GPT-2 to GPT-4 was simply a matter of more training with the same general model architecture. Leopold breaks it down into three buckets. Bucket number one is just how big the computers are that you use to train. Bigger and more efficient computers are more powerful and therefore you put more training in these models. Big machine is better, basically. The second bucket is how you train those models, the algorithms that you run, the methods that you use. For example, you could train a model in a different way such that the whole thing runs faster and is more efficient. Then the third bucket is sort of a miscellaneous bucket of rather small changes that actually translate into very big wins. For example, people discovered that asking ChatGPT to think step-by-step step through a problem before actually solving it improved its accuracy. Just a small little change, but that actually resulted in a big win in its reasoning capability. Leopold's estimate is that from GPT-2 to GPT-4, the models got somewhere like six to eight orders of magnitude more training. And each order of magnitude is 10 times. So what he's saying is 1 million to 100 million times more. Then he's looking forward and estimating from GPT-4 today onwards, we're gonna get another five to six orders of magnitude. So that's another 100,000 times 
to 1 million times improvement. And parts of that are somewhat believable, right? Like Microsoft is already saying quite publicly that they helped build an absolutely massive computer to help OpenAI train GPT-5. And people are already calling for even more computing resources, even larger computing clusters to train these models. Ultimately, Leopold looks at all this and comes to the conclusion saying, Look, the train isn't stopping here. I mean, each of these three buckets still has lots of room to run. And honestly, I believe that 1 million times more training starting from GPT-4 will turn into a human level AI researcher. And again, once you get one AI that can be an AI researcher, you have millions and now you're on a path to super intelligence. Before we continue, let's just talk very quickly about why AGI and ASI are so important. Once you have AI that is powerful enough, you can do so many things that you can't even think about today. Let's talk about weapons. Any government that gets super intelligence can make crazy powerful weapons. They can hack into any system. I mean, the limits of what we think are possible are defined by human abilities. And now we have AI that can do more than humans. In fact, super intelligence would turbocharge any research effort you can think of. I mean, again, you have a million PhDs that can think about any topic you want and develop research in any field. It'll nearly instantly automate all work. I mean, definitely for knowledge workers like me who spend our days just typing on a laptop all day, but even for people who deal with the real world, like plumbers, a super intelligent AI could definitely on its own figure out how to make robots that can replace plumbers, okay? So the consequences are massive if you can get there. So with all of this as the backdrop around AGI and ASI and the consequences, with such dramatic outcomes, people's instincts immediately tend to be like, okay, sure, that's definitely happening. I mean, how many times have people tried to sell others on some big lofty dream like this, right? It's such a far reaching sci-fi world that it can be hard to picture as reality. Which brings us to some of the debate at hand about this set of essays that Leopold Aschenbrenner has written. At the core again, is this assumption that we're gonna get another 1 million times more compute, and that the models are gonna keep improving at the same rate as they have been. The honest reality is that we have no idea if that's actually the case. Nearly every technology so far follows an S-curve. They taper off at some point. The more you put into it at some point, you get less and less improvement over time. So why is this any different? Why should we assume that we have more gas in the tank for the next five years? Plus, there's another practical question about the data. When you train AI models, you need the data, and we just don't know if there's actually enough data or if we're going to run out. I mean, even Leopold himself acknowledges that this is a possibility. He says that the latest AI models do already train on most of the internet, but he goes into ways that you can improve on this, even if you do run out of internet to train on. So for example, there's a lot of crap on the internet today. And by training on all of the internet, you're also training on all of the crap. What if you didn't? What if you trained on the entirety of the internet, but only the section that is high quality and not crap? That might make the models better. So there's plenty of debate about whether or not we actually are going to get to AGI on the pathway that we're on. And by the way, we haven't even talked about what to do do about all this. That's a whole different can of worms. Leopold's essays have a bunch of arguments around China and enemies of the West and how to defend against them and how the government should be involved. Each of those is a big meaty topic around security and geopolitics and the government. Way too much crazy stuff. But to wrap it all up, the people who really wanted to work on making AI safe at companies like OpenAI legitimately believe that AI is going to be as powerful as, or even more powerful than, humans. And it's going to happen very, very soon. Nobody knows if they're right, but the question is what to do when you don't know if they're right and when the stakes could be extremely, extremely high. This is Pete wrapping up the Neuron for June 6th. I'll see you in a couple days. Ah!